Welcome to episode 38 of the MMA Rundown Podcast. We finally have a UFC fight to preview. It's been a while. I think the last one we had was the Korean Zombie versus Frankie Edgar one, so at least now I actually have to a preview. So I'll be doing a full preview of the UFC 246 card, obviously starting with the Conor McGregor fight against Donald Cerrone. Other topics to talk about, Jessica Penne looks as though her career may be over with the UFC after a positive test from USADA, so I'll talk about that whole entire situation, what her case is, what USADA's case is, uh, and then where I stand on that. Um, we've got Douglas Lima. There was a bit of a debate on the Joe Rogan podcast where Joe was saying that Douglas Lima is absolutely an elite quality welterweight right now. He may even be good enough to be the champion in the UFC right now. Brennan Schaub was disagreeing. Uh, a lot of people avoided in on that, so I'll get my take on that as well. We've got Mike Perry getting in a little bit of trouble online after getting into a, a dust-up with a 52-year-old actor. I think it's Michael Jai White. Uh, we've got... Colby Covington, some news in terms of him returning to competition. There was an announcement made by his coach, Dan Lambert, that he is going to be taking a high-level grappling match. He didn't specify where it was going to be or who it was going to be against. Um, but that information in and of itself is actually pretty interesting, given that a lot of questions around him and his return was based around a broken jaw, and you would figure with a grappling match that if your jaw is still cracked, you would not want to be doing anything like that. We've also got Ryan Hall. Uh, calling out a couple big name fighters who are both featherweights who moved down to bantamweight, and then having a bantamweight call him out, and it sounds like there's a chance that fight be made, might be, that fight might be made. Uh, we've got a few fight announcements that just came across this week, and the last thing to talk about is just gonna be some wrestling updates in the NCAA Division One world with the conference season now starting to kick into gear. Uh, big Ten season just got going this week. Had a, a handful of really important duels with some some big match results already, so I'll, I'll recap that as well. So back to the start, we've got UFC 246, and I'll just be previewing the entire card, so we'll start the main event with Conor McGregor versus Don Cerrone. Talked about this fight a little bit in the past, but I'm going to talk about uh, some other things I don't think I've brought up yet. So to me, my big point with this is that for Conor, they were looking for a fight to, to get him back in there against someone who's got a name, uh, someone who's highly ranked, uh, but someone who's still like a winnable matchup for him. And, and to me, the Cerrone matchup is a, a perfect matchup for him. Obviously, when you're looking at the top 15 lightweights, there are no easy matchups there. Um, but if you're going to try to find one that's winnable for Connor, you're going to try to find someone uh, whose weaknesses are are, are are sort of opposite of Connor's strengths. So for Cowboy, his weaknesses oftentimes come in the boxing range on the feet. Connor's an excellent boxer. Uh, he tends to start slow. Connor starts incredibly fast. Uh, he's had issues with body shots in the past. Connor has an excellent. Uh, front teep that he uses to to work as a body shot, but he also is really good about mixing up to the head and body as well once he's in the pocket. So at least on paper, this matchup should be very winnable for Connor. And even if you think about Cowboy, uh, think about where he's good, uh, very good off of his back, but you would figure that Connor's not going to take him down, and if he rocks him, he's going to be very careful about uh, where he engages. We've seen how he handles himself against guys like Nate Diaz when he knocks them down. Uh, so I'd imagine that if he does get a knockout against Cowboy, uh, he'll definitely survey the situation, decide whether or not he thinks that Cowboy's in a position where he's going to be able to attack him or whether he's in a position where he can be, where he can be able to get the finish. So I don't know if that's going to be a major concern for him. I don't see Cowboy pulling guard here. Cowboy has decent takedowns himself. Um, his top game is pretty good, but a lot of what Cowboy's known for on the ground is more so uh, his submissions off his back. Not that he can't fight off on the top. Obviously, he's got pretty good guard passing. I think in the Alex Oliveira fight, he took Oliveira down, uh, passed his guard, and finished that either from mount or from the back. So Cowboy's capable of doing that, but I, I just see this fight being one where, skill for skill, Connor should be able to get the win here. But Cowboy, obviously, we're talking about a guy who is a, a big 155er, a guy who's fighting at 170. He has a lot of power. Uh, he can knock you out with his hands. He can knock you out with his kicks. And uh, unfortunately for him, one of his better kicks is that lead switch kick um, from Orthodox. So that's a left kick which is a little bit more effective against another orthodox fighter than it is against a southpaw. Uh, but it can still be effective, with that being said, especially if you can get Connor leaning, um, trying to avoid a punch. So it's not as though that's that weapon was taken away. I just don't think it's going to be as useful as it otherwise would be against someone in a different stance. Uh, but if I had to pick this fight, I would definitely put my money on Conor McGregor. Like I said, Cowboy has ways to win, but this fight was made uh, with getting Conor a, a big-name win in mind. You look at the matchup, it seems to make sense for Connor, the timing of it. Yes, Connor hasn't fought in MMA since he fought, fought against Khabib, but Cowboy recently got knocked out by Justin Gaethje. Uh, he's had a, a few months since then, but you, you'd figure that all all signs are pointing towards Connor getting the win here. Now, if, if he does get the win, there's been plenty of talk, of, of course, about who does Connor fight next. Uh, for him, it's probably going to be 
it's probably going to be up to him, which is a good situation for him to be in. If he wants Jorge Masvidal and he calls out Masvidal, I'm sure Masvidal is going to push hard for that fight and they're going to make it. If he wants Khabib, uh, that one's a little bit different because we've still got three months until Khabib and Tony Ferguson fight. We don't know what's going to happen there. We don't know if both guys are going to make it. And even if they do both make it and you wait until April 18th and they have a classic fight, maybe the rematch is the fight that I want people, a lot of people want to see. Uh, so would it make sense for Connor to win this fight and then wait three months uh, see what happens against uh, Khabib and Tony, and sort of put his career on hold for that amount of time, especially when he's talking about how he wants to get three fights this year. I don't know that it makes the most sense. I mean, I guess in theory, um, if they can get like a three or four month break in between that that fight in April and then the next fight, he could still get a fight in August and then take another fight in December and still get three fights in a year. But to me, the, the lightweight title fight doesn't make the most sense for him right now in terms of what to call out. Um, but the, the Masvidal fight seems to be one that makes a lot of sense for him. It seems to be one that he's asking for. Uh, another option could be for him to take a fight with Gaethje and sort of have an agreement in place, or at least have like a backdoor agreement in place with the UFC where it's like, hey, look, I'll, I'll take Gaethje. I don't know what that he'd want to be underneath Khabib on the card in April, uh, but maybe for a card that's like in May or June. Um, but kind of have an agreement in place like, hey, if anything happens to this Khabib versus Tony fight, put me in. And he's talked about that, how that's something that he wants to do. Uh, so maybe at least on paper, um, get himself in there with Gaethje. And if something happens to the title fight, then you slide in. If not, then you, you go ahead and fight Justin Gaethje. That can serve as the number one contender fight, and then you're ready to go at lightweight if you get the win. So those would be his options for for a cowboy if he wins. Um, he's got all kinds of options, really. He, I don't know that they'd want to put him in for a title fight right away, especially if Tony Ferguson ends up winning the title. Um, you could probably... I, I guess, unfortunately for him, the, the, the guys who are the money guys right now are, are like your Nates, your, your Jorge's, and your Connors. And assuming he gets the win over Connor, I guess you could run back the fight with Connor if Connor really wanted to like push for that. But he's already lost to Nate. He's already lost to Jorge. Um, both of those guys are bad matchups for him, uh, especially given their their advantages in the boxing. That's where Nate beat him. That's where Jorge was able to knock him out. Um, but I guess those fights both happened a long time ago. The, the Jorge one, not, so, not as long ago. Uh, but you could make the argument that based off of the star power that he could, he could build off of a win from Connor, that that's where he can go from there. But Cowboy's kind of at a, a point in his career where I don't think anyone expects him to win a title. For him, he, he's just sort of at a point where he, he's taking fights, making money, um, just, just building his name as that wild, crazy Cowboy guy who goes out there and, and takes out a challenge no matter what. So for him, if he gets the win, this would be as good a time as any to try to argue for a title fight. I don't know. I don't see him beating either of the champions, but... To me, th this is sort of a question that probably isn't going to need an answer, and I, I think Connor's going to get, get the win regardless, at which point Cowboy can kind of just keep fighting uh, some of the higher-ranked guys at lightweight or move back up to welterweight and fight, fight other ranked guys there, uh, but just be put in exciting matchups and keep winning Fight of the Night bonuses as he's been doing up to this point. For the coming event, we have Holly Holm versus Raquel Pennington. This fight happened a long time ago. This was Holly Holm's first fight in the UFC, and Holly was able to win a very close fight. Uh, so now they're having a rematch right now after all this time. I think this fight was actually scheduled for late 2019 and ended up getting pushed back. Uh, but as far as the matchup goes, you would figure that over time it would it, it would favor Holly and that Holly probably um, is no worse of a striker, has no less of an advantage than, than she did in that first fight. Um, but at least in terms of being able to defend takedowns and at least handle herself on the ground, she, she's definitely made some improvements there. Uh, so you figure that Pennington would have a harder time taking her down. Uh, if the fight stays on the feet, then Holly would be able to outpoint her. This is going to be a three-round fight. The odds on it are pretty close. I think it's nearly even odds. Um, but I, I would imagine that Holly's, Holly should have the edge here. But, but again, with Holly, uh, she had a great start in the UFC, um, all, all the way up until she was able to win the title against Ronda, but since then has been pretty inconsistent. She built a pretty big name for herself by getting that win over Ronda. Did a lot for her, kind of like what I was talking about with Cowboy, where if Cowboy gets the win over Connor, it's going to build, build him a lot. Uh, the Rondas and the Connors, if you get wins over them, it, it helps your career immensely. But for Holly, after getting that win, though she's made a good amount of money, really hasn't been all that uh, successful in the cage. Has, has definitely suffered a lot of losses, uh, a lot more than I think a lot of people would expect expected out of her, especially given her run to the title and then winning that title afterwards. Um, but I, I would pick her in this particular matchup. Pennington, plus, is, she hasn't quite looked too good ever since that loss to Amanda Nunes. She looked pretty solid up until she got that fight. Uh, obviously, Nunes is a tough fighter. It's tough. You can't expect her to win that fight or dominate Nunes, but ever since then, I just haven't seen quite the same Pennington. Um, fight before that, we're going to have Alexia Olenek versus Maurice Green. 
I know a good deal about uh, Lenik. Don't know a ton about Marie's screen, so can't really pick a fight if you don't know about one of the fighters. That's kind of a key thing to key thing to know if you're gonna break down a fight. Uh, we got Claudio Gadelia versus Alexa Grasso. Uh, Gadelia is another one where really strong start in the UFC and has sort of struggled of late. Was at a point in her career where it was kind of her and Joanna Janjacek who were sort of like one A and one B at at um strawweight where. No one was really beating either of those two, but the winner of the matchup between the two of them would be the champion. Um, they would be having really competitive fights where each fighter would take multiple rounds, but in the end, Joanna was able to get the wins in those matchups. Uh, but while Joanna is now fighting for the title against Wei Li Zhang, uh, Claudia has just been a little inconsistent, and now she's having a tough fight uh, scheduled ahead of her for against Grasso. You'd figure if this fight goes to the mat that Gadella is going to have the advantage there. The question is going to be how successful is she going to be at getting it there? Um, and what's this fight going to look like on the feet? Uh, is Gadelia going to be able to keep it competitive enough on the feet? Uh, is Grasso just going to be able to outland, outland her and keep, it, keep her at range and just be able to pick up a decision that way? Uh, that, that remains to be seen, but this isn't a fight I plan on betting on. And then to start at the main card, we have Anthony Pettis versus Diego Ferreira. Diego Ferreira has been fantastic ever since... Um, well, I think it's a five-fight win streak now. His last fight was against Maribek Tysimov. Tysimov is a guy who I've been talking about for a while as one of those guys where because of some visa troubles, we never really got to see how good he was, but I was pretty sure that he was a guy who was top 10 level, if not even top 5 level at lightweight, but just wasn't getting the opportunities to prove it. Had a string of like five straight knockouts at lightweight, but again, wasn't able to get matchups with some of the better guys just because he couldn't fight in America. And with the UFC being an American promotion that does most of their, um, does most of their shows in America, if you can't get a travel visa, that's going to be a big problem for you. You, you have to rely on top-ranked guys going outside of their country to fight you. And so he had Diego Ferreira actually went out to Abu Dhabi to fight him. Uh, and after a really good first round for Tyson Mal, Ferreira just put it on him, uh, winning the final two rounds and winning that fight. So it really impressed me a lot with Ferreira. Ferreira's obviously got a great ground game, but the fact that he was able to, to keep the fight standing there with Tyson Mal for the last two rounds and beat him up there uh, was extremely impressive. Uh, with Anthony Pettis, a, a very difficult matchup that he'll have there. Pettis, you would figure, should have the edge on the feet. Uh, at least early, you should have the edge on the feet. Uh, but if Ferreira is able to hang hang around and and survive, the, the question is going to be: is is his striking at a point where he can actually like hang with Anthony Pettis in the later rounds? And also, if this fight goes to, goes to the mat, Pettis is a black belt. He's very good on the on the ground. Uh, very good submissions, especially off of his back. Very good trap guard. Really good at grabbing the wrist and kind of manipulating wrist and finding ways to sort of like pummel his leg in there for a triangle or cut angles and catch arm bars. Uh, so, so he's got some positions that he's dangerous from, but he's also shown in past fights that he'll get his guard pass every so often and get caught in some bad spots too. And you'd figure that with a guy like Ferreira, if he's able to get some good spots on uh, Anthony Pettis on the ground, uh, that he'll kind of lock it down, keep it tight, and just sort of slowly advance rather than just be over aggressive and get into a scramble where Pettis gets away. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see if this fight goes to the ground, how that works out as well. But for me, this is another fight where I just I don't want to bet on it because. You would think, had I not seen the Tysima versus Ferreira fight, I would easily say Pettis is going to be the guy who gets the win here. Uh, but that Tysima fight really showed me a lot of Ferreira, and I feel like there's still more to see with Ferreira, just to kind of see where he really does, where he really does fall here. That in, in beating Tysima, that really impressed me. It showed me a lot, but I, I think this fight here with Pettis is going to show me even more. If he does get a win here, obviously with Pettis being ranked, it's probably going to put Ferreira in a position where he's ranked, and it's going to put him in a position where he's really going to start getting some real big opportunities at lightweight. Uh, to see how far he can go up that ladder. On the prelims, the prelim main event, uh, this will be on ESPN, is going to be Roxanne Modafferi versus Macy Barber. Modafferi with a record of 23-17 and 17, uh, versus Macy Barber, who is 8-0. Modafferi, just, she, she's gotten a lot more wins than I, I ever really could have imagined in the UFC. Uh, doesn't have a ton of power uh, on the ground. She's solid on the ground, but she's not like overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly impressive. Uh, she's been in this game probably for like 12, 15 years, if not more. Uh, still hasn't earned her black belt, even though grappling is her, her strongest suit. Um, so it, do I see her being able to win this fight in striking range with Macy Barber? I mean, Macy is not the most technical, but if she does land, she, she definitely hits pretty hard. So even if Modafferi is able to start well and land, land some nice shots on Macy, I feel like Macy's going to be able to land, at least land a couple really hard shots on Roxanne. And the question then is going to become, is Roxanne going to be able to eat those and keep moving forward? Or is she going to start panic shooting? If she does panic shoot, or if she does panic shoot, how effective is she going to be at that? Uh, is she going to get in any good positions? Um, or is she just going to get caught in even worse positions and then just finish from there? Uh, so 
for me, I think skill for skill, Montefiore is probably more skillful than Macy Barber is, but Macy's a much better athlete than Roxanne is. And for that reason, what, what's tough here is that w the way the odds are set, I think um, Macy Barber is a 10 to 1 favorite versus Roxanne being a minus or a, or a plus 650 underdog. Those odds, if you're looking at it from a skill standpoint, they don't quite jive with reality. I, I think Montefiore is a better grappler than Macy Barber is. Um, possibly a better striker, although she's not a great striker. Um, but the better athlete is Macy Barber. Macy Barber seems to be a better competitor as well. And oftentimes that can that can go a long way. But to me, this isn't a fight where I think it's just like, oh my god, Macy Barber's going to murder her. Uh, I, I would probably see Macy Barber winning, but those odds are kind of at a level where I feel like it might be worthwhile just to throw a little bit on Roxanne. Uh, but with that being said, th there's a difference in what I'm saying now in terms of like saying throw a little bit of money on Roxanne because I think the, the numbers are a little bit off and saying that I think Roxanne's going to win. I don't know that I think Roxanne's going to win. I think she has a chance to win. So I think if you're going to be given plus 650 odds, you might as well like throw five bucks down or throw 10 bucks down on it uh, just because you, you could get a good little return out of it. But I would still imagine that the athleticism here is going to play a big role and Macy Barber is going to be able to get a win. Uh, other problem we have Andre Philly versus Sadiq Youssef. Uh, Philly's a really dangerous guy at featherweight. Um, it was sort of interesting to hear Max Holloway a little while back say that of the guys he had fought at featherweight, Philly was his toughest matchup. Uh, and this was right before the Alexander Volkanovsky fight that he said that. Uh, Philly's had some tough fights, had some tough losses, um, had that really bad knockout loss to Yair Rodriguez. So for him, uh, it, it sort of remains to be seen how he'll do here. Sadiq Yusuf, he's, he's pretty good, I think. Because other Nigerian fighters have done really well, there's been a lot of hype around him as well, where it's kind of like, well, we see these other Nigerian fighters who are just dominating. Sadiq's from Nigeria, so therefore Sadiq's going to dominate. Sadiq's a, a pretty good all-around fighter, but I, I don't see much um, in, in watching him where it shows that he's like fantastic in any given area. Like He can hit hard. He's got decent striking. I think he's a purple belt in jiu-jitsu, so he's got pretty solid jiu-jitsu too, pretty solid grappler. Um, but I don't really see like one area where he's just absolutely dominant. And uh, against a guy like Feely, Feely's also pretty good all-around. Uh, so you'd figure this fight's probably going to be on the feet for the most part. I don't know that either of them have a major advantage over the other on the ground. Uh, but if this fight does stay standing, Philly's probably going to have a little bit of a range advantage. Uh, Yusuf probably a little bit of a power advantage. Um, trying to pick that. I, I'm sort of leading Andre Philly on this one. Um, but I've kind of gotten to the point where I don't like betting on fights if I'm not really sure about it. And this is one where I'm not really sure about it. So... Fights like this, I, I guess if the odds are just really skewed one way or the other, then you kind of throw some money on the one who you think can get you a really good return. But this doesn't seem like a really obvious choice either way for me. Uh, then we have Drew Dober versus Nasrat Hakparast. Um, very intentional matchup set up here. Uh, Dober is just a huge, lightweight, uh, excellent striker. Uh, his background is uh, is from kickboxing. Has decent takedown defense. Um, is an okay grappler, but where he really wants most fights to be is going to be on the feet. Now it's right, Prost also enjoys being on the feet for the most part, so you're probably going to have two uh, really high-level strikers fighting in there with four-ounce gloves. Um, Hawk Prost has been really hot of late, so it's sort of hard for me to pick against him. Uh, it's not as easy a matchup as I think some people are assuming here. If, they don't, if they're not too familiar with Dober, this is not going to be an easy matchup for Hawk Prost. Dober's a very dangerous guy. He hits incredibly hard, and he's a very good kickboxer. Uh, but I think Hawk Prost is going to be able to, to win this fight in boxing range, uh, knock him down, and then be able to finish him on the ground. Uh, and then we have Chaz Kelly versus Grant Dawson. I uh, don't know a lot about Grant Dawson, though he's 14 and 1. Chaz Kelly is 18 and 4. Uh, so, again, if I don't know much about one fighter, it's hard to really pick the fight. Then on the ESPN Plus prelims, we have Alexa Kamer, 5 and 0, against Justin Ledet. Uh, I think Ledet's last fight was that 15 second loss to Johnny Walker. Uh, we've got Tim Elliott versus Askar Askarov, which is going to be a ranked flyweight fight. Elliott, I think, is number 8, and Askarov, I think, is number 10. Uh, but Askarov's got pretty good, um, pretty good wrestling himself. Elliot's a decent wrestler. He's also got um, some really good chokes. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how that goes. We've got Brian Kelleher versus Ode Osborne. I think Osborne's coming off of the Contender Series. Um, and then Sabina Mazo versus J.J. Aldrich. Aldrich, I might be wrong about this, but I think her last fight was a fight against Macy Barber where she had won the first round on the feet against Barber, uh, but got caught in the second round and finished up against the fence. And then Mazo I'm not particularly familiar with. So that covers it for UFC 246. Obviously, next week's podcast will be recapping it all. Uh, I'm sure plenty of it will be about Conor McGregor, although it is worth mentioning with this card, if anything happens to Conor or Cowboy, particularly Conor, this card is just <laughs> not a very strong card, top to the bottom.
But again, it seems like this was a card that was made last second after Connor made it clear that he wanted to return and wanted to return in January, which is sort of weird because you'd wonder how long the UFC would have gone without fights at the start of the year. But maybe they found that January fights aren't aren't the biggest um, aren't the biggest fights for them. So next topic to talk about is going to be Jessica Penny and her battle with USADA. So she put up a really long Instagram post saying that she had previously been suspended for like 18 months uh, for something that her doctor had given her because she had some some issues with, I'm trying to think of what the word that she used was. Um, I think it was like endocrine system issues. Um, but whatever the case may be, she was, she was having some issues with the doctor, had to help her out and, um, and provide her with some medicine. And the medicine, um, I don't think it was testosterone, but I think it was, um, it was something else where, where you have to be careful based on, um, where they were trying to get her levels back to normal. And I think there was a, a possibility that in doing so, they sort of like went a little bit too far with it. Either that or the medicine itself was something that was illegal. So anyway, she gets suspended 18 months, uh, ends up missing that entire time, uh, is looking to come back now and again gets suspended again. And this time she's saying that the, the test that she got suspended for, it, it was off of a tainted supplement and that the amount that was in her system was not a performance enhancing amount. And it was sort of like in that picogram range, which is where we saw with John Jones. Uh, not only did he get to fight, but they actually moved an entire event for him and then sort of announced a change of the rules uh, to say that when you kind of have amounts that are so small that they're in the picogram, picogram range, that you're not going to take these guys out. So it sounds like with her, there's concerns that they're, they're not really consistent with how they've done this in the past with other fighters. Um, she feels as though in order for her to fight it, it's going to cost her like thirty or forty thousand dollars with um with attorneys, and that's money she doesn't have. And she feels like because of that, because she doesn't have the money to fight it, that effectively her career is being ended by Usada in a way that she can't even like properly defend herself. And so she made it out to sound as though Usada was really doing her wrong and doing her dirty. And Usada responded to it, and their response was not a very strong response. Their response was effectively along the lines of, "Well, Jessica said that we're ending her career. That's not true. She's allowed to defend herself." Um, but her point was that she doesn't have the money to defend herself. So just because she's allowed to doesn't mean that she can or that it's feasible for her to do so. So to me, if we're going to have to like say good guy, bad guy here, it definitely seems like good guy Jessica Penny, bad guy USADA, given that USADA's main case was, well, you can defend yourself. But for her, given the money that she's made, that's not really feasible. And even still, if she's innocent, like I guess maybe you sue USADA and get the money back. But that's a really long process, and you got to have that money up in the first place. So right now they're doing a GoFundMe to try to try to fund the defense, but it seems like a really bad situation that she put herself in. Uh, now, with that being said, there have been a lot of responses to it. A lot of people, I, I think, have sort of felt the same way I do looking at this, where they just kind of feel like Jessica Penny is in a tough position where she can't really appropriately defend herself. Um, but then some other people are like, oh, this is why we need to get rid of USADA. At that point, I'm a little less bullish on, because the thing with me is that with USADA, at least, when USADA suspends TJ Dillashaw because they run an EPO test and find that he's been cheating, no one's like, oh, this is why I got to get rid of USADA. As a matter of fact, most people are really happy about that. Um, when USADA kind of screws over a fighter like this and people are like, all right, well, let's get rid of him. I would like to see it where USADA does... I, I don't want USADA having um, really negative actions, sort of like what we have with Jessica Penny, but they also have positive actions, and you kind of have to weigh the positive and the negative and determine whether or not it, it's worth keeping him around. Now, unfortunately for the UFC... By having USADA in the first place, by having what's considered uh, one of the strongest drug testing companies out there, even if you have a situation like this where Jessica Penny is getting railroaded, for the UFC, like your your best bet is either to like throw some money at Jessica Penny and try to like help her fight it off, or if you're going to get rid of USADA, then you're going to have to understand there's going to be a PR consequence to that where people are going to be saying, hey, the UFC used to have really strong drug testing, but then they got rid of it, therefore everyone's on steroids now, or therefore they don't care about steroids. So by having you sought in the first place, getting rid of them is going to put them in a bad spot um, from a PR standpoint. And so in that way, they're sort of tied to them. Um, but with that being said, I, I think for them, it might be worth looking into cases like this where maybe if you can help some of your fighters out and help throw some money their way, at least give them a chance to defend themselves. That might sort of soften it where when the negative aspects of you saw to come around, at least you sort of soften them. The, the positive aspects when they're there, I think most people appreciate and they they agree with having USADA around, like I mentioned with TJ Dillashaw or any other uh, fighter who gets popper steroids, especially if they were actually cheating. It wasn't just like a, a little amount that they got in a, in a tainted supplement. 
Um, but I, I guess at, at this point, I feel like I pretty much said everything that there kind of is there I, for the research I've done on it. I, I guess the deeper you look into it, maybe you can learn a little bit more and have, have a stronger take on it. But for me, I think USADA, it, they, they have enough good things about them. They, they've done enough good things where it's not like just toss them out and toss out the baby with the bathwater. But situations like this with Jessica Penny definitely aren't a good look for them. Uh, it's definitely not fair for them. I guess the, the point I made with the UFC paying for Jessica Penny's defense, the downside there would be if Jessica Penny actually did take something and she's just kind of like crying wolf here. Um, then does the UFC say, hey, actually, we just spent $40,000 on your legal defense. You actually did cheat. Now you owe us $40,000, even though we told you we were going to pay for it in the first place. Can't really do that. Um, and if they already paid for it, they're like, okay, fine, we're not going to ask for the money back. Well, then you just paid an extra $40,000 to try to help out a cheater. So I guess from the UFC standpoint, that would be the, uh, an area of concern for trying to help out and help pay for fighters who are, who are trying to defend themselves. Uh, maybe you just make that part of the program, hire a couple attorneys on staff who specialize in this, and that's just their job is to, to help fighters out in, in cases like this against USADA. But I, I guess even there, that could be its own issue, where if people find out the UFC is paying lawyers to, to fight off USADA cases, so that can be a problem too. Uh, so it was sort of a sticky situation. You, you like when a, a cheater gets caught. You don't like when someone who most likely isn't cheating ends up getting their career railroaded. Uh, what do you do to, to fix a situation like this? I, I guess if you guys have any thoughts on that, definitely add them to the comments. Um, or if you're listening to this on audio, uh, I guess you could just like either track down the track down a video version of it on YouTube or BitChute, or you could um, just send an email to the MMA Rundown at gmail.com. Let me know, and then I'll, I'll be sure to talk about it on the next show if, if I get some responses on that. Next topic to talk about, we have... Oops, page just turned. We have Douglas Lima and the JRE debate. So, the uh, effectively, the debate that happened is Joe Rogan and Brendan Shaw were talking about Douglas Lima and where he would stand in the UFC. And Joe's case was, I think Douglas Lima is good enough right now. He's at least got the knockout power, where if you put him in against a guy like Kamaru Usman, put him in against a Colby Covington, put him in there against the top guys in the UFC... He can definitely hold his own there and maybe even get a win. Um, Brennan Schaub was pretty dismissive of that, was saying, hey, look, y you know, that's what you think because that's, you've se that's what you've seen Douglas Lima do, but you've been seeing Douglas Lima fight against weaker fighters. I'm definitely on Joe Rogan's side on this. I think that Douglas Lima is definitely an elite welterweight. Uh, but on top of that, and this is sort of something that you see in sports all the time uh, with debates, is that when you start debating how one guy could do against another guy, quickly it, it goes from debating who's better to then, like, debating about the other people who they've competed against as if that really affects it. If I'm asking you who's going to win a fight between, say, Douglas Lima and Kamaru Usman, the relevant information there is what are Douglas Lima's skills, um, how, how well does Douglas Lima compete, what, when, when Douglas Lima is on the ground, how good does he get getting up, um, what sort of techniques does he like to use to get up, what sort of techniques does Kamaru Usman like to use to keep people down, what do we think would be effective um, comparing those two? Like, there's a lot of, like, specific comparisons, like, between their skill sets that you would actually want to make. That's all relevant. Um, talking about who Douglas Lima fought in the past, like, comparing MVP to Leon Edwards, that's not relevant. What What is relevant is the actual skill sets there when you're comparing one to one or comparing one fighter to another. So with Brendan Schaub, when he was trying to make the, this comparison of, like, well, look who Kamaru's fought and look who Douglas Lima's fought, that's irrelevant. It sort of reminds me of just the tired MJ versus LeBron debates where people... I'll get to a point where they just kind of like hit an impasse on who's better between MJ and LeBron, and they start talking about, well, who's better, Hakeem Olajuwon or Tim Duncan, because these are the guys who they had, who these guys had to compete against. Like they would start just arguing about the different players who were in the league at the time, rather than arguing about the skill sets of each individual player. If we're asking the question, is Douglas Lima good enough to be a top UFC welterweight? Is he good enough to beat the welterweight champion? The argument needs to be Douglas' skills, Douglas's skills versus the champion skills. Douglas' skills versus another elite UFC welterweight skills. It's not relevant who Douglas has fought in the past. Who he's fought in the past, the, the relevance there is like this is at least like some context that I have for how he does against an elite fighter. So at least there you can kind of like use that as context to say, well, against an elite guy like Rory McDonald, we Rory McDonald we saw this, therefore I can assume that he can. Do we, we saw X against Roy McDonald, therefore I can assume he, can, he would do Y against Kamaru Usman or something like that. But to just make an argument, well, this guy's fought tougher guys, therefore he's better, that's that's not actually a legitimate argument. So that's the argument that Brendan Shaw was making, and I definitely don't agree with that. Um, obviously, we would have to see Douglas Lima fight against the top guys in the UFC to know how he would do against them. Um, but based on the information I have and based on what I've seen from him in the cage, I would have to assume that he can definitely hang with some of the top guys, if not beat them. Next topic to talk about is going to be... Uh, Mike Perry. 
Uh, so Mike Perry got into some weird argument with Michael Jai White. Jai White is an actor who I believe was talking about Kimbo Slice. Uh, I guess he was sort of like insulting Kimbo's skills as a street fighter. Uh, Michael Jai White, I think, has a couple different black belts and some different martial arts. Obviously, Kimbo wasn't the most technical fighter in, in his day, more of a boxer than a um, than a grappler, obviously. Not a great wrestler, not very good jiu-jitsu. His boxing, if you compare that to what you would see in professional boxing, it's not as though that was particularly impressive either. Um, so I, I think Michael Jai White's point was that Kimbo, though he was sort of like the street legend, really wasn't that great of a technical fighter. Um, but Mike Perry took issue with this. Uh, Kimbo, having actually fought in the UFC and actually tested himself against some of the best, um, in, in doing so, obviously earned respect from a lot of people, but um, among them was Mike Perry, and he felt as though Michael Jai White, who hadn't done the same, uh, really was in no position to be ripping on Kimbo. So he initially had a had a tweet uh, somewhere along those lines. Mike Michael Jai White then responded to him, at which point uh, Mike Perry responded to Michael Jai White using the phrase "bitch ass nigga," uh, with the word there at, at the end causing a lot of concern, obviously, uh, with Mike Perry being white. Uh, Perry, a little while back, said that he like took a DNA test and he found he was like two point six percent African or something like that. Um, but obviously, that's most people feel as though if you're going to be using the N word or whether it's the one that ends in E or the one that ends in A, which is the one that he used, uh, he, most people shouldn't be saying that in general. But if you are white, you definitely shouldn't be saying that. And Mike Perry is um, mostly white, so I think a lot of people took issue with that. As far as where I stood with that, um, obviously he, he shouldn't have said it, but do I feel like Mike Perry? is a racist or that he hates black people um, based off of what I've seen from his actions. No, I don't feel that at all. Um, so should he have said it? No. Do I think that it were, when he was growing up, it was like, okay for him to say that with the, the friends he knew? I mean, probably it seems like if he was comfortable saying that on, on Twitter, that he probably had enough experience saying it where there weren't, there wasn't enough blowback and he felt comfortable doing it. Um, but yeah, de definitely wasn't the smartest thing to do. There's a lot of other, a lot of other ways to insult someone uh, without saying that. And, definitely got himself in some trouble there now of course because mma journalists seem to hate their hate their followers more than pretty much any other profession hates their customers uh they took advantage of that opportunity to then just rip on uh a lot of mma fans who weren't all that upset about it uh from the responses i saw there weren't a lot of people saying yeah mike perry should say that or yeah michael jai white is one of those it was more just like yeah whatever like it's not that big of a deal and a lot of people have like, look at the responses here this is just terrible what a cesspool and you're seeing a lot of uh, top MMA journalists, obviously, you, you guys like Luke Thomas being like, look at how awful MMA fans, this just shows how bad they are. And, uh, again, to me, this this wasn't that major, th that big of an issue. It's not like fans were saying, yeah, you, he should have called him that, or yeah, he is one of those. It's just like, yeah, I, I just don't think it's that big of a deal. Um, j just given the context, they're like, yeah, we don't feel that Mike Perry is like a, a big racist for saying it. He shouldn't have said it, but it's, it's not like a, a huge deal you kind of wonder at, at at what point or like the top MMA journalists or, or a lot of MMA journalists in general who just feel as though anytime something like this happens that they just have to shit all over the MMA community. Like when they're just going to be tired of the MMA community as a whole and just like find a different job. Uh, I, I put up a tweet that was um, something along the lines of MMA journalists seem to hate their, hate their customers or hate the people who pay their bills more so than a prostitute hates her Johns or they complain about it more than a prostitute would complain about their Johns. Um, just to say that it seems like it happens like every other week where there's just some major complaint. Oh my God, I hate the MMA community. Oh, they're the worst. Oh, look at the MMA fans. Aren't they the worst people? Oh God, I can't believe I have to give content to these people. Like it's, it's just kind of tiresome there and it, it's just kind of annoying. And I, I guess in part having people like that is part of the reason why I feel like I, it, I feel like it's worth my time to, to put out some content every week, put out podcasts like this. Cause I don't feel that way towards the MMA community. Uh, I think a lot of the MMA community doesn't feel as though it's a, a fair way to be looked at. And why listen to them and have them make a bunch of hot takes and have them constantly rip on people when you can just kind of be a little bit more fair-minded and just take things for what it is. Um, but I guess that's kind of all I really care to say about that. There's, I, I think there's a lot more I could say about it, but it, it kind of goes from talking about MMA to then just talking about people who cover MMA, and I think it, that can get a little bit boring. Uh, most people who are interested in MMA don't necessarily care about the people who cover it more, as much as they care about the sport itself or the storylines themselves. So I think it's time to get back to that. And getting back to that, we'll talk about Kobe Covington. So his manager, Dan Lambert, had an interview with James Lynch 
uh, from the score MMA. And in that interview, um, Dan Lambert said that Colby is coming back in March for a grappling match, a high-level grappling match is what he said. Now, again, it's not clear who he's going to be fighting, where he's going to be fighting. Uh, there was a promotion that was done um, down in that South Florida area where they had Anthony Pettis versus Jorge Masvidal in a grappling match. And that match um, wasn't terribly competitive. Not to say that one guy was completely better than the other, but more so to say that they weren't exactly um, competing as though it was like the finals of the world <laughs> either. Um, it seemed like both guys were just kind of like screwing around there a little bit. Uh, so maybe they're going to be doing a promotion like that where Colby Covington will be doing one of those types of matches. Maybe even against another guy who's in the UFC or another big name like that. Uh, we've also seen a lot of high-level grappling matches where they'll take a, a, a top-level MMA fighter and put them in there against a high-level jiu-jitsu guy. So we just had another one of those with Ben Henderson over the weekend where he fought against Marcio Andre and ended up losing that match. Marcio Andre is a former black belt world champion, I believe. Um, but if he's not a world champion, I believe he's at least a medalist. Uh, so that sort of like shows you the level they're at. So maybe they're looking at doing something like that with Colby where they're going to put him up against a an elite black belt and see how it goes from there. I wouldn't imagine that would go great for Colby. Um, but I think the bigger point there, and then the main reason why I'm bringing it up, is that the big concern for Colby is that if he did break his jaw, and it sounds as though there was at least a fracture to it, you'd wonder what the timeline would be like for him to get back. Grappling with a broken jaw is a terrible idea, uh, especially with all the chokes that are involved, especially a lot of people when they get to the rear naked choke. Uh, it's tough to get underneath the chin, so a lot of times people will just try to choke right through it. And you would imagine that if Colby's going up against a high-level jiu-jitsu guy who's able to get his back, uh, that they're going to try to go for a choke, probably trying to choke through the chin um, if he doesn't give up his give up his throat. So if the jaw is in a position where it's not necessarily safe to come back, taking a match like that in March would not be a great idea. So at least I would take that as a bright sign, or as a good sign that a comeback for him isn't all that far away. I think he's going to be returning to training in another month. Uh, so again, that seems to be pretty good news as well. I would still like to see Tyron Woodley versus Leon Edwards. I don't think that fight's been made official. We've been hearing about it all the time, uh, but I don't think that fight has been made official yet. I think in part because we're waiting on this fight with uh, with Conor McGregor to happen because if he ends up winning and then decides to fight Jorge Masvidal and Masvidal is out of the title picture, then you got to shuffle someone else in there for a title fight. So the division's sort of on hold right now until Cowboy or Cowboy and Conor fight. But there, there's a chance that if Tyron Woodley and Leon Edwards isn't made sometime soon that Tyron Woodley versus Colby Covington is a fight that could be made um, maybe looking at April, May, even early June. Um, so it seems like we're at least starting to get an idea of what a timeline for a Colby Covington comeback is like. Uh, obviously after that last fight we've been wanting to know that and it looks as though we're getting pretty, pretty close to finding out. Next topic to talk about is going to be with Ryan Hall. So he got tired of people turning down fights with him and decided that he was going to start calling people out um, in, in a very respectful manner. I thought he had like these two graphics uh, with him and then another fighter across from him. Uh, one of them was with Jose Aldo, and then one of them was with Frankie Edgar, and then his caption was like, look, I'm having a hard time for finding fights. Um, you guys tend to fight anyone anywhere. I, I both respect you as legends. Would you guys be willing to fight? Don't think there was a response from either Edgar or Aldo. It is worth noting that Edgar and Aldo are both fighting at 135 right now. Ryan Hall is fighting at 145. Uh, so the weight classes don't quite work out there. Aldo is obviously, obviously looking for a title fight at 135. Edgar is looking for a fight against a top contender at 135. Uh, hopefully for him, that'll give him a chance to show that he can hang with the top guys in that division and maybe even get himself a title fight somewhere down the line. So with that being said, I don't think either, either of those two fights are going to happen, but Pedro Munoz, who is a top 10 guy at Bantamweight, uh, responded to that and said that he'd be willing to take that fight. Would it make sense for Munoz? I mean, I guess if he's looking to move up from 135, I guess fighting a guy in Ryan Hall who's ranked at 145 would make sense. Uh, if he's just looking to go up there for a quick fight and then come back down to Bantamweight, I don't know why he would do that. So I guess before this fight gets made, they'd probably have to look at what the long-term plan for each of them would be. Uh, if Munoz, I, I, I guess for Ryan Hall, if you get a win over a ranked Bantamweight and he goes back down to Bantamweight, it doesn't do quite as much for you as a, as a win over a ranked Featherweight, but it, at least it kind of keeps you moving forward. Uh, so for him, I guess that fight makes sense. For Pedro Munoz, I'm not sure it makes a ton of sense. Uh, but that being said, if this is a fight that is made, I would have to favor Pedro Munoz pretty heavily. Uh, Munich is a very high-level black belt himself. Ryan Hall is obviously a very high-level black belt and is used to beating high-level black belts. Uh, but I think he'd have a pretty tough time with Ryan Hall. Or I think Ryan Hall would have a pretty tough time with Munoz. Uh, but then on the feet, Munoz would have a pretty big advantage. Uh, I'd imagine he would be willing to get in range and risk Hall shooting in front of Minari roll underneath him. I think he'd be comfortable enough defending those leg locks. Um, granted, I don't, know that, I don't know where Munoz's game is at uh, in terms of fighting off legs. He's got an excellent guillotine. Um... Pretty good top game, pretty good guard passing, pretty good at getting the back. 
but I would have to imagine that matchup would strongly favor Pedro Munoz. You can't count on a guy like Ryan Hall, but that'd be a tough matchup for him. A couple more things to talk about. We have a few more fights that were announced. We have, speaking of high-level jiu-jitsu guys, we have Adolfo Vieira, uh, who is coming out from win over Oscar Pihota. He's going to be fighting Safarbek Safarov. So the guy's a bit more of a striker than Pihota was. Uh, so for him, if he's able to get the fight to the ground, that's going to be really good for him. I would imagine he'd be able to finish a lot quicker than he was against Piota. Um, but if he's not able to get the fight to the ground, that's going to be a really big problem for him because Safarov is a better striker than Piota is. Uh, we also have uh, Cowboy Oliveira, who was supposed to be fighting against Mickey Gall. That fight got um, got canceled, and I think a lot of people assumed that it was Cowboy Oliveira who got it canceled because uh, I think he had some issues with domestic violence. Uh, apparently that wasn't the case. Cowboy's in a new fight now. He'll be fighting against Max Griffin. Uh, so Griffin had a win over Mike Perry in the past. Uh, really bad loss to Colby Covington earlier in his career, though. Uh, but a pretty good striker. Uh, sort of tough to take down, although I guess Colby's able to take a lot of good guys down, like Robbie Lawler. So I would still say that Griffin's got decent takedown defense to, in, in spite of that Colby Covington fight. Uh, not that it would matter here. I don't think Cowboys Oliveira is going to be trying to take him down. I think it's mostly going to be a striking match. Uh, so you got the heavy-handed Griffin versus Oliveira, who's got a, a few more weapons, but probably doesn't hit quite as hard uh, but you'd imagine this is one of those fights where heading into that card you would have to put some money down on that down on that being fight of the night if fight of the night is a prop bet that's available for you and then the last one to bring up is going to be rose mama Yunus, uh finally returning to the cage and she's not coming back to an easy fight she's gonna be coming back to face uh jessica andraj so we'll have the rematch i believe this one is going to be a three-round fight i think it's gonna be on the undercard of the khabib versus tony ferguson fight uh, so, interesting story there is you're getting the return of Rose. You're getting the return of Rose to Brooklyn, which is where that whole dolly on the bus situation happened, where she was talking about how she had um, some post-traumatic stress from that. Um, so, f- it's going to be interesting to see how, how she looks here. She looked really good against Andrade, I think, up until she got knocked out in the second round. Y- you could almost argue that the Rose Namunas we saw in the first round and early in the second was the best technical women's fighter we've seen in, in the octagon at this point. Uh, looked really good on the feet. Um, when the fight went to the mat, I mean, looked pretty decent there. Was attacking. I uh, was looking for a Kamara on the first slam. Uh, looks like as though she was getting close to getting to finish there. So if we can get that Rose back uh, and she's able to sort of avoid, if she gets in a position where she gets slammed rather than trying to catch a Kamara off of it, just kind of make sure you don't get knocked out with the fall and then you either attack from, your, attack from your back or work your way back up, we can definitely get an impressive uh, showing out of Rose here. And with an impressive showing, I guess if she's really committed to the comeback, we may even see her get a title fight sometime soon as well. So this is going to be a really big fight for her where if she can kind of pick up where she left off in that first round against Andrade, um, we'll, we'll probably get a great performance out of her. And I think the title fight, yeah, the title fight with um, Wei Li Zhang and Yuani on Jacek will have happened by then. So if Yuana has the title at that point, uh, maybe you argue that Rose is ready to, to go back and win her title back from Yuana again. Um if Wei Li's got it, then you've got a new matchup for Wei Li. And again, if she looks really good against Rose Nami Yunus, or if she looks really good against um, Jessica Andrade, then you can say, okay, well, this is going to be a really difficult matchup for Wei Li. So you can you can have a really interesting uh, style matchup there as well. So either way, if, if Rose gets a win here and wins the way that I think she's capable of winning, we could see her in a title fight pretty quickly, um, probably by third quarter, if not fourth quarter of uh, 2020. Last thing to talk about is college wrestling. Uh, a few updates uh, from there. So we've had a bunch of dual meets this week. None of the major ones yet. So it's not like we've gotten like the Penn State versus Iowa, Ohio State, Penn State, Penn State, Ohio State, uh, or, or any of those. Uh, but we have had some pretty good matchups uh, of some top ranked guys. So worth mentioning right now, at least. Uh, I, I guess I'll start off more so rather than talking about matches, uh, talk about some lineup adjustments, and then I'll get to the matches after that. So for Iowa, I talked about how at Midlands at 184. Uh, the guy who finished highest with a- was Abe Asad, a true freshman, uh, finishing in second place. Uh, then they had Cash Wilkie, a senior, who finished in third place, uh, lost, I believe, in the quarterfinals, and then won every single match to get all the way back to third. And then Nelson Brands, who had the starting spot heading into then, uh, lost in the quarterfinals and then lost to Cash Wilkie in the back draw. So it looked as though Wilkie, and- Wilkie was, ahead of Ka- was ahead of Nelson Brands for the guys who were in the current, ra- current lineup. And the question would be, would Abe Asad get his retro pulled, and would they bring him in? And my argument was that it probably wouldn't be worth it because it's not as though he was that much better than Cash Wilkie to really justify it. But with that being said, I think for Iowa, they're looking at it from a standpoint of this is a year where we actually have a chance to win it all. Let's put our best foot forward. Don't don't give up a point at any weight where you don't have to. And if they feel like Avis Hod is going to give them their best chance at scoring the most points at 184, then that's the guy you go with. 
that logic makes sense to me. I guess the only question that I would have is, do you honestly feel that Abasad is going to score more than Cash Wilkie, and how sure are you of it? I believe Wilkie, Wilkie obviously has the wins over, win over Brands. I think Wilkie had a win over Abasad in the wrestle-off, but when you're looking at Nationals, it's not who's the best in like a in-house tournament. It's who's the best against the other guys in the country. So if you feel like the Midlands result told you that Abasad's going to do better against outside competition than Cash Wilkie is, then I guess you go with Abasad. Uh, it seems like that's the decision that was made. I don't know all the... I don't know everything that the Brands brothers do know. Um, so I, I guess based on the information they had, they felt that that was the right decision. Tough for me to question it, but Assad had a couple matches this weekend. Um, both, I believe, against were unranked guys. Both were wins. Neither of them were bonus point wins, though. Just had a two nothing or two takedown to zero win against Purdue today. So he's getting wins, but he's not exactly getting dominant wins. But again, it's not as though Cash Wilkie was dominating guys either. It's not as though Nelson Brands was dominating any guys either. Seems like Iowa's got three different guys who could be ranked in the top 15 if they were all at different schools. Uh, but only one of them can represent the Hawkeyes. Looks like Abasad's is going to be that guy right now unless he starts losing some important matchups. So is that going to be the right call or not? That's really a question that no one's really going to have the answer to until they have hindsight. And I don't know if it's fair to the brands that it, everyone else is going to wait until they have hindsight and they have to make that decision now. But based on the information they have, they feel like that's the right decision to make. Um, so that's Iowa looking to add some points to their to their overall team at Nationals for Penn State, who is the team that likely would be number two, if not number one. They are in a position where they just lost a, a few points, you would assume. So they lost uh, Anthony Kassar, their national champion heavyweight. He got injured at the U.S. Nationals, um, Senior Nationals. Um, looks like it's a shoulder injury, so he's going to be out for the year. So they're bringing in a retro freshman in Seth Nevels. Uh, Nevels, I believe right now, is ranked in the top eight. Uh, he'll still be able to put up some decent points for Penn State, but is he going to be able to win the national title like Kassar was? Probably not. Uh, so you're going to lose some points there from some wins. Is he going to be able to get the bonus, get bonus points in the same way that Kassar was able to? Probably not as well. Uh, so you would figure that at least at heavyweight, Penn State, um, who is already probably behind Iowa in the team race anyway, uh, has put themselves a little bit further behind there. At 197, though, they had Kyle Cannell, who started the year ranked third. Uh, wasn't a great wrestler for most of his career, but did have a fantastic tournament. A couple of years ago for Kent State, uh, got a couple wins over the guy who currently is number one in the nation at 197 and Colin Moore in that tournament. Uh, didn't wrestle last year, came back this year and really wasn't looking too good at the start. Uh, well, now he's done for the year and they're moving up Shakur Rashid uh, back into his spot. Shakur is, a, I believe, is a former All-American. Uh, I think was the number two seed last year at 184, uh, but missed most of the season with a knee injury. Didn't have a great tournament. Uh, don't even believe he f finished as an All-American at 184. Uh, it's coming back this year. Looks like he's still dealing with some knee with some injuries. For him, you would figure that when healthy, he's definitely good enough to be an All-American and probably would have a better season than Kyle Canella would. The question is going to be how healthy is he going to be uh, for Big Tens and then more importantly for NCAAs. Uh, he's looked okay to this point. I think he just had a loss this weekend. Um, don't remember who it was to. I think it was to the guy from Northwestern. But to me, it's sort of hard to say whether or not Penn State is any worse off now with with Shakur Rashid in rather than Kyle Cannell. Uh, so I guess maybe there you could argue that they might have even gained some points back by making that switch. Um, but they're also then moving him up from 184 and hoping that Aaron Brooks, their freshman, is able to, to have a really big year and at least make it to the All-American stand. Uh, based on his senior freestyle results, there's reason to believe that, but the folk style is a little bit different from freestyle. So it remains to be seen how, how good he'll be able to do the entire season and how much improvement we'll get out of him. Uh, but then as far as matches go, there were a few really big matches in the Penn State, or not the Penn State, in the um, in the Iowa versus Purdue meet. Uh, the biggest one from the start was going to be Michael Kemmer versus Dylan Lottie at 174. So Kemmer has been ranked number three all year at 174, but really hasn't had a chance against the best guys uh, to see where he's at. Uh, Lighty has gone 20-0, uh, but despite that, was only put at number four, uh, even though a lot of his other guys at 174 haven't had as many matches, haven't, haven't had as many wins as him. Uh, definitely haven't had the same record that he's, hit, that he's had. I believe he won Cliff Keen Las Vegas and also the Midlands. Uh, Cameron missed the Midlands due to, I guess, what was called a health thing. I don't know whether or not that was like an injury or whether that was a sickness, but whatever the case may be, we got to see the match between Cameron and Lighty. Pretty close from the start, but as the match wore on, Cameron really started to take over. Eventually in the third period, was able to just hit takedown after takedown. It uh, wasn't enough to get the major, but definitely was enough to get a convincing decision win. Uh, never got taken down by Lighty in the process either, so really good win for Kemmerer. Uh, solidifies him at number three, maybe even moves him up to number two now that we've actually seen him against a top-ranked 174-pounder and for him to get an impressive win at that. 
Uh, we also had a really good match with Christian Brunner and Jacob Warner. Both of these guys were tied one one piece with each other. Um, really close match. Uh, third period comes around. Um, Brunner's starting on bottom. Warner, um, as, as Brunner's coming up, Warner had like a cross wrist grab on him. I was able to pull him backwards and uh, put him on his back. Uh, so I got some back points there. Then I was able to add a takedown as well. Uh, didn't score enough to get a major, but definitely did enough there to get the win. So Jacob Warner gets the big win there at 197. Uh, so he was number four heading into that match. Brunner was number two. Brunner did suffer a loss earlier in the weekend to the same guy uh, from Northwestern. Uh, so for Brunner, it kind of sucks for him because he had a great Midlands and did himself a lot of favors there. Do, did himself a lot of favors, but had a tough weekend here. And you, you kind of wonder how far he's going to drop for Warner. You'd figure he probably slides up to number three again, uh, which is a good spot for him. You would hope that by the time NCAAs come around, that he's sort of like in that two to three range. Um, rather than having to face a guy like Colin Moore in the semis, because if he's in the 2-3 to three range, it's probably a little bit more feasible for him to make it to the finals, and those extra points would be huge for Iowa. Uh, so so good news for them for, for them to get that win there, but also to get the win uh, with a pretty convincing scoreline, um, based largely on the back points that he was able to score. So that covers it for this week. Obviously next week there is going to be the Conor McGregor fight, so I'll be talking about that. I'm sure there'll be some more stuff that comes up with college wrestling. Uh, and with it being such a big week for the UFC, I would imagine if you're going to drop some news, uh, you might as well do it while you have a lot of eyes and ears on you, and they are going to have a lot of eyes and ears on them. So I'm sure next weekend or next week's show is going to be packed full of uh, a lot of interesting topics. So look forward to it.